I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness, right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? I'm still very anxious. Well, you were anxious last week. Well, I'm even more anxious today because last week Rusty was riding in the race to try to win the $1,000, but we stopped just before the race was to end. And I'm anxious to see if he'll win today. And I'm anxious too. And then I'm anxious to see whether Dick and Captain Perry will get their ship unstuck. Because if they don't, the enemy could just blow them to pieces. Now, you see why I'm anxious? Now I see, and I'm anxious too. Well, then, will you please hurry and read me the funny? Puck the comic weekly. Yes. I'll read that in just a moment. But first, before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, under Bringing Up Father, Beetle Bailey. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. <whistles> Toot me a toot and tweet me a tweedle. Squeeze out music for Bailey the Beetle. <whistles> Beetle is at the amusement park getting a little relaxation from his problems with the army. At a shooting gallery... <whistles> He makes a bull's eye, and the attendant says, Congratulations, Mac, you won our best prize. And he hands Beetle a doll. I won that. As he walks through the crowd, Beetle exclaims, Dolly, I can't let any of the guys see me with this. Then he sees a little girl. He walks over to her, pulls out the doll. Would you like this nice dolly, little girl? The little girl's mother yells, Becky! And wallops Beetle over the head with an umbrella. Hey! And she walks off with little Beggy. How many times have I told you not to talk to strange men? Beetle struggles to his feet, clutching his aching head. Last picture, top row, he sees a hole in a wall nearby. Hey, I'll chuck it in this hole while nobody's looking. He turns around to walk away. First picture, bottom row, the doll shoots out of the hole. Hey! Hitting Beetle in the back of the head. Beetle picks up the doll. Oh, gosh. And he goes over to the Tunnel of Love, which is a spot where people in a boat follow a little river that goes into a dark building. Beetle tosses the doll in the water. You caused me enough trouble. A woman standing nearby yells, Help! Police! An officer rushes up. The woman points at Beetle. He threw a child in the water. As the cop glowers at him, Well? Beetle says, It was just a doll. I'll get it. <laughs> Last picture, we're back at the army camp again. Beetle walks into the bunkhouse carrying his doll. As the guys stop talking and stare at him, Hey, look! Beetle says, The first joker who opens his yap gets one wet doll for dinner. Oh, I wish I'd been there. He could have given the doll to me. Yes, no one wishes that more than Beetle. Well, he shouldn't be so ashamed of being a nice doll back to camp. Maybe one of the soldiers has a sister. Yes, and maybe Beetle will discover that and send it to her and make her happy. Well, I hope so. Yes, yeah, so do I. Well, now let's turn over the page to Prince Valiant. Oh, yes, Lilith, because those mean men have captured little Prince Arn, and they're taking him far, far away. But Tillicum, the Indian maid, who is Arn's nurse, has followed his trail through the forest and is trying to catch up to the men. But the men are riding horses, and Tillicum has to run on foot. Oh, I wonder if she'll ever catch up with him. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Hackett, Breckett, Grey Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> for two days, Tillicum has trotted doggedly on the trail of Prince Arne's capturers. She comes to a brook. And she sees that the horse's tracks lead him to the water and that the brook is still muddy. Tillicum knows now they're just ahead. She glides onward. Silence is now more important than speed, for the day is ending, and her enemies will surely stop in the next good camping place. And then she hears voices, and the sound of an axe, and the rattle of harness. She creeps closer, last picture top row, to a spot from which she can watch and wait. First picture second row, she sees their camp through the trees. As the kidnappers settle for the night, they talk and laugh, for they feel safe from pursuit and are boastful of their craftiness. 
and Tillicum learns who's behind this foul deed and why. It's the middle of the night. The men are fast asleep. Suddenly, little Prince Arn is awakened by a hand over his mouth. Then he feels the familiar braid of Tillicum's hair against his cheek. In the velvety darkness, a dying ember reflects on a naked knife blade as Tillicum cuts the rawhide thong that keeps little Arn tied to the hand of his capturer. And then Arn is in Tillicum's arms and is quickly carried away from the camp. Short distance from the camp, Tillicum finds soft earth where tracks will show very easily. She tells little Arn to walk through this soft earth, making sure his feet sink deep into the earth, leaving footprints. First picture, bottom row, little Arn does the work assigned to him with great enthusiasm. Then morning comes. The kidnappers discover that little Arn is gone. Quickly, they search for him around the camp. It's not long before they find Arn's trail leading away from the camp. Swiftly, they mount their horses and ride back up the trail to recover their captive. Not seeing Tillicum and little Prince Arn, who hide behind some fern leaves in the forest. Then, last picture, Tillicum and Arn hurry to the campfire where the men have left their supplies, take what food they'll need for their long homeward journey, and in a moment, they will be ready to begin the journey back. Yes, at last she found him, and he's safe with her again. Isn't it clever how she fooled those men by having little Prince Arn make that trail so she could lead them away from the Yes, camp? you bet it was. I wonder if she will get him safe home. Well, don't forget Boltar is trying to catch up with her, and if he does, then she'll have someone to help her. Mm, I hope they'll meet. Well, we'll find that out next week, and we'll find out for sure if they do. Now, how would you like to see what Donald Duck is up to today? Oh, I like that very much. Very well, turn over the page. And there on page five is Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squeeze them, squeeze them, squiddly chicka chat. Let's have music to fit a quack quack. Donald isn't feeling very well, so he's going to a doctor for a checkup. Third picture, top row, the doctor listens to Donald's heart. Ooh, my, my, my. Then the doctor listens to Donald's stomach. Dear, dear, dear. The doctor says, you eat too much. Not enough exercise. And as Donald stands up, the doctor says, mow your lawn, spade your garden. Work, work, work. <laughs> Donald isn't happy with what the doctor has told him. So he goes to another doctor to see what he has to say. First picture, bottom row. Doctor number two is looking down Donald's throat. Uh, say, ah. Uh. Ah. Simple. You're underworked. Not enough stimulus to your glands. Get busy at something. Donald gets up, walks out of the doctor's office angrily. I think I need a specialist. Third picture, bottom row. Donald is at a specialist's office, under the fluoroscope. The doctor exclaims, Oh, dear, dear, dear. Yes, this is bad. But uh, there's hope. But we must act fast. Donald is dressed, the doctor says, uh, young man, relax. Fish, take it easy. Vacation and absolutely no work. You hear me now? No work. Last picture, Donald is sitting in a boat, fishing rod in his hand, sipping a cool drink, and he says, Nothing like a smart doctor. And the fish under the water look at Donald's hook and give Donald the laugh. a lazy thing. All he was interested in was finding a doctor who'd tell him to take things easy. <laughs> yes. Well, now let's turn over the page. Oh, look. Robin Hood. Yes, Robin Hood. And remember last week, 
that the sheriff's men disguised as Robin Hood's outlaws had attacked the wagon train that was carrying the gold that was to buy King Richard's freedom. Yes, because King Richard was captured, and the people who captured him won't let him go unless the queen will pay lots of money for him. That's right. And the reason the sheriff's men are dressed like Robin Hood's outlaws is because they want the queen to think that Robin Hood is the one who's stealing the gold. Yes, but Robin Hood received a message just in time, and as the sheriff's men attacked the wagon train, Robin Hood and his men came out of the forest to defend the queen and the archbishop and to save the gold. Ooh, I wonder if Robin Hood will win. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with the story of Robin Hood. It's merry, merry England in days long ago. Time now for Robin Hood. Some music. Hi-ho! <laughs> Head out of men! Robin and his men swarm over the sheriff's disguised bowmen just as they're about to seize the king's ransom. Robin Hood himself leaps onto the wagon where two men are trying to make away with a chest of gold. Stop, you! Stop them! With a quick blow, he sends one of the men toppling backwards off the wagon. <laughs> Another one comes at him with a sword. Robin catches his wrist, bam, and with a quick punch, sends him flying through the air. <laughs> Robin's men are making as good account of themselves, and the battle is over in a hurry. The sheriff's men flee into the forest, and last picture, top row, Robin hurries to Queen Eleanor. I pray you're unharmed, my lady. Those knaves are no men of mine. At that moment, little John comes toward Robin, pushing before him a man he's captured. This fellow will tell us whose men they really were, Robin. First picture about him, Row, little John gives the man a twist of the arm. Speak, I say. Whom do you serve? The man answers, The, the Sheriff of Nottingham. The Archbishop exclaims, Who in turn serves Prince John, the brain behind the ambush. The Queen thanks Robin for what he's done for her. Robin asks where the Maid Marian is. The queen replies that someone had said Marion had slipped away last night to join him. Robin replies, to join me. Oh, nay, my lady. Last picture, the archbishop says, ah, now tis clear. T'was Prince John who said she slipped away. And then comes the dreadful realization. Maid Marion is held captive by the ruthless Prince John. So am I, and I'm glad the gold to ransom King Richard is saved. Yes, but what about the Maid Marian? I wonder if Robin will be able to rescue her from that bad Prince John. Well, maybe we'll learn about that next week. Now let's pick up the very first page of the second section, because it's time for Dagwood and Blondie. Oh, and I just love Dagwood. The funniest things happen to him. Well, we'll see what funny thing happens to him today, and I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Dagwood and Blondie. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Ramafoo, ramafum, zim, zam, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. At the end of the week, after paying all the bills, Dagwood exclaims, Ah, lucky me. Two dollars and twenty cents left over this week. I'll put it in this little tin box and I'll hide it for a rainy day. Last picture, top row. He's digging into the top shelf of his closet. There should be a safe hiding place up here behind these old hat boxes. Five minutes later, second picture, second row. The dogs walk into the living room with a tin box and Dagwood's money in their mouth. And one of them says... <laughs> which means... We found it! Now it's our turn to hide it! And Dagwood cries... Oh, no! Not as quickly as that! <laughs> Last picture, second row. Dagwood is down in the basement, burying the tin box for the money under a lot of junk. He's saying, hey, The FBI and Scotland Yard working together couldn't find it down here. <laughs> Ten minutes later, second picture, third row. His daughter, Cookie, who has been playing hide-and-seek with some of her friends, dashes into the living room. Look, Daddy, we found a buried treasure. Two dollars and twenty cents. Oh, no, 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 no. Give it to me, it's mine. <laughs> Last picture, third row. Dagwood is slamming his hat on, heading for the door with the money in his hands. There's no use trying to save money around this house. I'm going out and squander it in the most useless thing I can find. He opens the door, and first picture, bottom row, delivery man steps in and says cheerfully, A COD package for Mrs. Bumstead, $2.20. Dagwood's hat pops off. <laughs> to the penny! <laughs> 
A moment later, Dagwood brings the package to Blondie. Blondie, quick, tell me, what's in this package? Oh, goody, it's the new household budget book I sent for. And she unwraps it, she says... It tells you how to make your salary and expenses come out even every week. And last picture, Dagwood drops to his knees, buries his face in his arms, and pounds the table in misery. <laughs> oh, it certainly worked good this week. <laughs> Poor Dagwood. Now when a rainy day comes, he won't have a single cent. No, poor Dagwood. No matter what he tries, it always goes wrong. Oh, I love him because he makes me laugh. <laughs> yes, me too. Well, now let's turn over the page. Oh, look, there's Flash Gordon. And you remember, Flash is on the planet Venus and he's been captured by that cruel King Stang. Yes, King Stang has sent Flash out into the jungle with Queen Vicky, where the harvesters are at work. And he told Flash that he must guard the queen against some strange creatures called the Blue Ones. And they're terribly dangerous. And last week, as Flash came to the forest where the harvesting was to be done, the blue ones were hiding in the trees but nearby. The, but the queen didn't see them. So I'm wondering what will happen. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Riga riga doon doon saskimatash. Let's have music for heroic Flash. <laughs> Landing her jet car in a jungle clearing where her harvesters are at work, Queen Vicky thrusts a chemi gun into Flash's hand and orders him to stand guard and watch for the blue ones, saying that they strike without warning. Taking no chances, Vicky commands one of the tree men to set up another guard post at the jungle's edge. The tree man is a veteran of earlier brushes with the blue menace, and he walks his post tense and alert. But even his keen eyes fail to detect the rubbery tentacle which stretches down from a tree to ensnare him. <laughs> Last picture top row, man and gun are suddenly clutched in a vice-like grip. The startled tree man barely manages to gasp out a cry for aid before he's crushed by the blue mass of protoplasm. First picture bottom row, the guard's cry sends a wave of panic through the ranks of the harvesters. With a frantic beating of wings, they flee from the danger area, leaving Flash and Vicky at the mercy of the blue menace. Flash hurries to the side of the stricken sentry. But he is too late. The guard is beyond help. And a winged feather that floats down through the trees is an ominous sign of the fate that has overtaken at least one of the fleeing tree men. Help! Flash! Help! Responding to Vicky's plea, Flash hurries toward her. At last picture, as he emerges from the jungle and brushes past what appears to be an innocent-looking fern tree, a pair of tentacles lash out and seize him in a bone-cracking grip. Oh, aren't those blue ones awful? They're as big as an octopus. Yes, those tentacles are powerful. And look, one has a hold of Flash's legs and arms. Well, what'll happen to Flash? Well, we'll find that out next week. And now I'll bet you're anxious to know what's happening to Dick's adventure. Oh, yes, I am. Very well. Let's go past Buzz Sawyer, turn over the page, and go past the Lone Ranger, and on page five, turn over that page. And here he is on page six. And you remember, Dick is in the early days of America with Captain Oliver Perry. Yes, America is at war with the English, and Perry's job is to defeat the British Navy, which is on Lake Erie. And the Americans had just finished building their battleships, and they tried to sail out of the harbor. But then they got stuck on a sandbar. And Perry's big problem is to get that ship off the sandbar before the British ship comes into sight. Because if he doesn't, the British can blow him to pieces because he can't move to get away. Oh, I wonder what'll happen. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Dick's Adventures. Say the magic words with me. Rickety pack, a zack, a zick. That's some music for adventurous Dick. Harry, knowing that time is tremendously important, says, Well, if man can move mountains, he can move my ship. He orders his men to unload all the fighting gear on board and put them on rafts. Then, first picture, bottom row. Men are set to work to dig underwater trenches and attach camels to the ship below the waterline. Camels are tanks filled with water. They are fastened to the ship a few feet under the water level. Then, water is pumped out of the tanks. And as the water is forced out, the tanks are filled with air, which makes them lighter. And they slowly rise to the surface, lifting the ship up with them. And this is the trick that Perry hopes will save his ship. The hours pass. Will Perry's scheme work? Will the camels, which are slowly rising higher and higher out of the water, lift the ship high enough 
to get across the sandbar. All night long, the men work. As the first gray of dawn appears on the horizon, fear clutches their hearts. Will the ship come clear in time? Then, last picture, second row, the great ship Lawrence trembles a move. The next second, it wrenches itself free from the clutching sand. A big cheer goes up. For the wind catches the sails and moves the ship forward across the sandbar. In no time at all, the fighting gear, the cannon, the powder, and the supplies are loaded aboard the ship. And like a great white bird, the Lawrence glides out into the open lake, first picture bottom roll, followed by the armed brig Niagara and a flotilla of schooners and gunboats. Harry's entire task force has safely crossed the sandbar. The wheels of fortune have turned. The pursued become the pursuers. Harry sets out to hunt down his enemy. He warns Dick. Keep your weather eye peeled, Dick. Now we're ready to meet them and give them another kind of banquet. And then Dick, last picture, is shouting. He, there they are, Captain Perry. I see him. I see him. I see him. Hey, what? Oh. And last picture, Dick looks around and sees he's in his own room in the world of today. And his father, standing beside his bed, smiles... Well, you've been dreaming again, son. My, wasn't that exciting? The way they got that ship out of the sand by pumping air into those tanks? You bet it was. Why do they call them camels? Because camels have a lot of water in them. Oh, and when they pumped the water out, it lifted the ship up. Huh? Yes, because air is lighter than water. Well, that was very clever of Captain Perry. You bet it was. And next week, we'll see what else happens. Now, look underneath Dick's adventures. There's Rusty Riley. Oh, and today we'll find out if Rusty will win the race. You bet we will. And if he wins that race, he's going to give the $1,000 to Mrs. Jones so she can pay that mean Mr. Marlowe. And then Marlowe can't take the farm away from Mrs. Jones. Well, please, quick read and see if he wins the race. All right, here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. We're at the county fair. Everyone in the stands is on his feet, cheering his heart out. Around the bend, into the last lap, come the thundering horses. And going neck and neck for the lead, our space pilot and another horse. Closer and closer they come to the finish line. Rusty shouts, Come on, space pilot, please! You just gotta win this race! And then across the line, the two horses flash neck and neck. And in the stand, a terrific roar goes up. Pete, Rusty's friend, sitting beside Stovepipe, says, He did it, Mr. Stovepipe! Rusty's won! The stovepipe answers, By Jove, he has. Practically a photo finish, but he won. First picture, bottom row, Stovepipe and Pete have joined Rusty down by the judge's stand. Stovepipe is saying, Ah, my boy, congratulations, congratulations. Allow me to escort you to the throne of triumph. Rusty replies, Well, all I'm thinking about is getting that purse and making tracks for Mrs. Jones' farm. This is the day that Marlowe is going to foreclose. They work their way over to the judge's stand. And as the ceremonies begin, one of the judges turns to Rusty and says, And now I take pleasure in presenting to Rusty Riley... Winner of the Blue Brook Handicap, this handsome trophy. Well, it's not a farm, yes, sir, yeah. And, and, now wait a minute, folks, wait. And the purse, which is $1,000 in purchase certificates from the merchants of our fair city. A startled look comes over Rusty's face as he realizes he doesn't have the $1,000 in cash. And cash is what he needs. He takes the certificates, turns to Stovepipe and Pete, and slowly they walk away.
last picture in the tack room, Rusty is saying, Jeepers, Mr. Stovepipe, what are we going to do now? You can't pay off a mortgage with purchase certificates, can you? Stovepipe answers, Well, my boy, it is a bit of a poser. It's certainly not customary, but I uh, suggest we go to this stony-hearted vulture and try. <laughs> They advertised that the prize was $1,000. I saw that myself. Yes, I saw it too. A great big sign. The word's right on it. Yes, and I know it won't do any good to go to Mr. Marlowe and give him anything but money because he doesn't want Mrs. Jones to keep her farm because he knows that the oil on it will make him rich. Yes. Well, Rusty's really faced with a problem now. Mm-hmm. How to get the $1,000 for these certificates immediately before nightfall so he can legally pay Mr. Marlowe the cash and save the farm. I wonder what he will do. Well, next week we'll find out, I hope. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Tonic Reading Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date. And a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man.